Hi, Joseph. All right, let's get rocking and rolling here. Um, and I'm just going to share my screen. See you later. And thanks everybody for signing in and welcome to, um, and I even wrote 2020 because I just didn't get enough last year. I guess I'm going to change that to 2021. We will properly start off the new year. Um, and I'm going to share the, we have a little bit of an agenda today. El Maiko, are you here with us too today? Joined in yet? I yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm here, Diane. Okay, cool. So um, I was hoping that Christian would be joining us too because I think he updated the community operator wish list, which is one of the things that I kind of need to start reaching out to the operator uh, communities and see if we can um, find some sort of a, a date time to do a hackathon on those operators, which is what, where we left off. Um, for those of you who didn't join our last meeting on the 22nd of December, because you were busy with holiday plans, um, all of the videos, I did manage to get everything updated and all the videos of all the past meetings are now um, I think I'm missing one in November that I'll just go dig up and, and put up soon, but they should be all there. So one of the things that we came out of um, the 22nd meeting was talking about reviewing and uh, the community operator wish list and seeing if we couldn't set up a time maybe to do something like a hackathon or pair programming with people from our community with the with a an advisor from the operator community um, about building a community operator for um, OKD, for the ones that are missing um, that normally come from there. And I'm looking to see now, has um, Vadim uh, joined the call? Not, you know, not Vadim, Christian. And I'm gonna unmute people, because nobody needs to be muted. But I thought we would kick off um, with that um, topic um, and unless, Vadim, you have an update on the release that you'd like to start with. Is there any... Yeah, not much has happened mm -hmm. in the technical side. The only major change is that um, our CI has been updated and the new registry is used to store the nightlies. So that would be registry.ci.openshift.org uh, with instead of previously registry.svc. Um, all the releases are still uploaded to Quay, so there hasn't been any change there. Okay. And so we didn't get a chance to merge a lot of code recently because of, well, everybody's on video. We'll catch up on that in the coming up weeks. Okay. Good. Um, I think that's all I've got. Do you have anything, Christian, from the engineering side to update people on? Or is that a... That was a sound like a... A warning signal. Um, this Chris, meeting will self-destruct in five minutes. I know. I always worry about that. So we got we did get some storm warnings here, so it could be that, but I don't think that's on my machine. So Christian looks like he's having a little difficulty getting in. So maybe instead of going through the operator wish list, we'll wait until that um, till Christian gets in here. Maybe maybe have you read that? Uh, but I I found out that also for some operators, the Quay issue um, I think with this mirroring bug um, with the wrong manifests in Quay um, is also affecting. So just um, just to be safe that everybody knows that if you try to mirror some operators um, on your local registry or private registry, maybe it won't work because um, um, the wrong manifest is used on newer Quay images. It, it seems to, to happen, it happened uh, somewhere in November, I think. Correct. Um, Basically, yep. all the new stuff we built from November is still okay. it. I'll add a notice to, to the issue in the FAQ, probably. Yeah, it's a, it's a funny, funny uh, thing uh, in, question, in, in question marks. Is that um, this issue, this pull request you mentioned in Slack, that is uh, taking care about the problem, uh, uh, was running in the uh, uh, image pull rate 
um, thing from uh, Docker Hub. They have limited the pull rate recently, and I think it's a, a bigger issue for open source projects. That has been fixed in uh, OpenShift CI. We used to pull images directly from Docker Hub. We don't anymore. So the next retest should make it go away. But oh, yeah, okay. uh, November has been a rough month for CI. <laughs> okay. All right. So um, well, Joseph, while you're talking, one of the things that you were doing is you had created your own um, community operator, and you were gonna you were thinking about. Um, and I know we had a holiday writing up a recipe or you know how you created that um, Tecton one. Did it was one. Yeah, I, I created a repository. Um, uh, I put a link also in Slack. Um, with the idea is that we create um, for all operators we are working on and where we cannot rely on the on the teams that they do it for us. That in the meantime um, we write descriptions of how we can build it on our own. Mm -hmm. So I have done that for Tecton already because Tecton is the simplest one. You have uh, to change nothing for that mm -hmm. on the code base. It's very uh, well prepared um, to build it on our own. Uh, the problem was um, in the last meeting we um, had the idea that I uh, posted to some uh, repository in Quay, some uh, some Joseph Meyer repository, and I had a, a few questions because uh, I also wrote that on Slack. I had a good day uh, where I wrote all that. A few questions uh, where I was not sure if I'm allowed um, to yeah write that Red Hat maintains that. Um, the ownership is not clear and so on. I was not sure if I'm allowed to do that and that's why I have not uh, um, opened the pull request before we answer this question. Can you... Um throw the link to that in yeah. the chat um, here so sure. that I can keep a reference sure. to it. Because that we, what I was um, hoping to do was use Joseph's um, exercise and write-up um, as a template for how to um, do all of the other community operators too. So maybe in, and run through that um, and any issues that you came up with so that we can rinse and repeat that um, as sort of the process for um, building um, community. Yeah, and I, I think for the time being, we could just uh, put uh, OKD uh, working group in, in the kind of maintainers field there, um, to not mention Red Hat, uh, since we're kind of uh, building these on our own for the time being. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing for a minute and see if I can find that note. Um, so if you can throw that into the in the chat, the link to what you did. So, um, what I think you're back here now, um, Christian. You were having some technical difficulties there for a minute. You went all purple on us and gave us a, a storm warning signal for some reason. Yeah, um, my, my camera seemed to have, uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's 2021. Into rainbow or something. What do you expect? Thanks, Joseph. Um, can I get you, Christian, maybe to share your screen and, and walk through the operator wish list and we'll drive that and then we'll do a bit with um, uh, Mike McEwen's um, must gather um, conversation and walk through the rest of the few things here that we have today. Can you see my screen? Does it work? We'll see. Yes. Yes. We yes. Do. Okay. Um, so I've uh, updated the the operator wish list a little bit, um, and yeah, uh, really, I just found uh, some of the operators are already available either in the uh, community catalog, which we install uh, by default on OKD, or also uh, in the upstream catalog. Um, there are a few operators that aren't currently built for any of the uh, public catalogs, uh, which are these, and, and there's more, more of them, I think. Um, yeah, but uh, for the wish list, um, we actually have quite a few in the community catalog right now. Uh, so, for example, the Maestra uh, Istio service mesh operator was updated recently. 
Um, and all of these other upgrades are available there. Uh, for the upstream catalog, I'm not actually sure whether that's installed. I don't think it's installed and enabled by default on OKD. Um, but you can do that, and then you'll also have access to, uh, to these operators here, uh, down here, among the more others. Um, Christian, the, the problem with Maestro was um, that the versions um, did not properly work together uh, between Maestra, um, Kiali, and Jäger. Um, we had to patch uh, lots of things to get it working. And, uh, yeah, and I, I, th I think that yeah. with the yeah with the Maestro operator, um, it actually has a dependency on the Elastic Search operator. I think. Um, yes. As and well. on Kiali and Jäger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yeah, and obviously we'll we'll need to make sure these versions match up then. Um, yeah. That would be, um, so uh, the plan is still, we have some kind of strategic uh, work going on, but then also uh, I'll just open issues on all these uh, repositories here um, to kind of request the team, the teams to uh, to add those builds to Operator Hub. Um, yeah, and so, um, so maybe one of the, if we can add a note to the Maestro, Kiali, and Jaeger um, in the list that they're dependent on Elasticsearch. Um, so has, has everything that's in the section that's available in Community Catalog been tested? Um, I just did the OADP. Has is, is, is anyone used any of these things on OKD or know of anyone who has? I think Which one? one? Uh, the Which OAD, the, the last one on the list was the one I was talking to someone about yesterday, OADP, the, the conveyor one. I think it works the other way around. So folks are publishing Kubernetes operators, but we don't see them by default in OKD unless they tested on OKD and they know that it explicitly works. So okay. everything so, ending up in community should work. Except for the top three, Maestra, Kiali, and Jaeger won't work unless we have elastic. So Kiali and Jaeger will work um, independently of each other. Um, then with this Maestra operator, I don't, yeah, they've built it and released it, but they have a dependency on the Elasticsearch operator, which I think obviously they, they'll take the downstream one uh, from Red Hat, which we don't from OpenShift, which we don't currently build uh, and release to operator hub. So um, yeah, the Maestro one probably uh, needs some, sure. some work there. Uh, but then all the others should work, especially those that are in the community catalog. Um, they can be installed independently of each other, uh, except for the Maestro one. And um, yeah, you should be able to test them. Uh, for those in the upstream catalog, um, they some of them might work on OKD, and especially those I've listed here, I think there's nothing that um, goes like against installing them on OKD. I, I would expect them to work. Um, and if we could get some people to actually just test those, um, that'd be great. And then we could easily kind of copy those over from the upstream catalog into the community catalog as well, uh, without having to um, actually rely on, on the maintainers uh, work here too much. But I think there is no... Oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I tried out the uh, Ceph operator, but not from a catalog. And I don't know if there is a, a cluster service version. What's the, what's the name of the CRD cloud, I think? But the cluster um, service I, versions are the operator. Yeah, and I think um, I, I did not found any uh, CSV for the Rook Ceph operator. Maybe we have to write our own. But this should be no big, big problem, in my opinion. It's already in the, in the upstream catalog, in the Operator Hub repository. That, ah, should okay. be the, uh, that should be there. It's just not in the community catalog, so it doesn't show up in OKD. Okay. Uh, okay. But if you enable the upstream catalog uh, manually by adding that uh, subscription, uh, then that will show up as well. And you can see the cluster service version in the uh, community app. Okay, it's a, it's a, it's a, indeed. Yeah, sorry. 
have a delay, sorry. Uh, and, the, and the idea is that we try it out uh, from the upstream catalog, and if it works properly, then uh, we can uh, create a pull request for the community catalog. Do we exactly. Then we can just create a pull request to copy that over to, we should be able to use the same contents there, um, I think. And it shouldn't be a problem to have those in the same catalog. But yeah, we can create an uh, APR and then have that reviewed. Okay. So I'm going to ask a, a, a question about um, process too. Once once we've done that ourselves, um, say we take the, the Rook Ceph operator from the upstream catalog and make a pull request like maybe Joseph does it, um, to put it in the community operator, isn't the end goal to get the the Rook Ceph community to, in their CI CD release process to make that pull request to us? Um, so we still need absolutely. To Absolutely, yes. Communicate um, with them and tell them what we're doing. So um, if if it does work, rather than us testing it, um, how do we communicate, I mean, how do we want to communicate to, I know the Rook Ceph people, because um, I've made them talk a bazillion times. Um, so, you know, I can reach out to them if someone, if someone writes that pull request in their repo, um, we put it put it in our community repo to start with, but um, what I yeah would so definitely we should uh, we should get the the operator maintainers to do that uh, eventually for all operators. Uh, right now, I think the the biggest hurdle here is that that isn't really an automated process to release to the operator hub. So there are a few scripts around to generate that data, but since that comes from a different repository from the repository where uh, the individual operator code sits. Um, updating the operator up each time is some, uh, yeah, involves some manual steps um, mostly. And I think once we get that to, uh, yeah, get more automation for that and kind of uh, can integrate that better with uh, with CIs um, and with these various CI systems we have, um, kind of just promote some builds whenever the maintainers decide to promote that to operate out, uh, that would be great. But right now it's kind of a manual process for most maintainers, which is a way they don't do it too often because it's manual. Yeah. Hey, so, Christian's John Fortin. Is there a is there a instructions on enabling the upstream catalog? I just looked real quick and I see the Red Hat catalogs in the community. I don't see a way of enabling the upstream catalog because I'd love to test the Rook Ceph operator. I'm right now I'm doing it by hand. Enable it inside of OKD. Yeah, I mean, you said in the upstream there catalog, should be some some documentation on the operator SDK documentation on how to enable um, right. secondary where, cat, uh, catalog sources. Right. But where is it? I mean, you say the upstream, but I don't I don't know where that is. Where is the upstream catalog? The OKD is it? Are they pulling? Oh, um, do you have a link there? Throw that link in chat once you're done, I'll throw it in. And maybe add it into your your um, your gist file there. Um, I'm not actually sure, I'll, I'll find it. Okay. Yeah, because without without knowing how to implement it, I can't test it. <sighs> yeah, I think there's some, before we could do a hackathon or anything, that's kind of why I was um, trying to tickle uh, or tease out of uh, the Tecton work that Joseph was doing, sort of a template for um, how to do this. Yeah, so these are the sources um, in the community operators. Um, repository in the upstream community operators directory. And yeah, I'm, I'm not sure what the catalog sources would uh, exactly look like. We, we currently add them to our machine OS content. Um, but, but maybe you can uh, find a link uh, um, where we do that. Yeah. Basically, I don't know. Uh, it's a great documentation bug. Um, in short, uh, operator for operator 
framework folks are pushing three different container images with an index of the operators. And we know two, we just need to find out which image is being pushed for upstream catalog. Um, let's file a bug and track it. I could, I could find some experts in the field. So Joseph is is um, in the chat is suggesting that we um, should create some notes in the um, OKD cookbook how to build an operate OpenShift operators for OKD, um, and I think that's that's really what I'm getting at is that if once we have once you guys create that documentation, then then rolling out to the um, the list the wish list that um, Christian is curating there. Is that wish list um, for other people on it? Are there things missing from that? Um, is anyone, I know Joseph, you've been watching this closely and. Um, I, I, I will actually to... open an issue on the, on our uh, OKD repository, or, or actually the community repository uh, for this. Uh, so we can kind of have people throw in their own suggestions. Yeah. yeah. Diane, you, you were asking before about if anybody had run those operators on OKD. I've run previous versions of the Open Data Hub operator on OKD, and I think that's that's going to – I have a feeling that will be a very popular day two operator because, you know, everyone's going to want the ML stuff. Um, yeah. It's also like a meta operator. It installs other operators of its own. Um, I have a feeling it's going to be really difficult to test, like – the experiences that I've seen from people who are running the current versions is that like some parts of it work really well, other parts of it are extremely difficult to operate. So that, that may be one that it will probably require a lot of testing. Um, fortunately, the team that's working on it is really good about, you know, responding to uh, requests and whatnot. Yeah. Is this the so TensorFlow thing? TensorFlow and Jupyter? It's KubeFlow Kube Open Data Hub. So Open Data Hub is a project that is it now includes KubeFlow and it also has like support for Apache Spark. Apache, you know, it uses Strimzy for Kafka and it has a bunch of machine learning and you know data specific data analysis specific packages inside of it. But it does a lot of this through importing other community operators, you know, to do that work. So things like installing Jupyter Hub. I think they have a Jupyter Hub operator for and you know, etc. The, the, there's a Spark operator that's involved. You know, those kind of things. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we could but, also participate in testing that because uh, of the use already a few of these operators you mentioned. Yeah, yeah. So, like, there's a lot of really popular machine learning and, like, you know, I dare use the word artificial intelligence type stuff in that operator. So, you know, we just, we get, I see a lot of people wanting to do that as, like, a day two operation to open up, you know, let their users start working on AI type stuff. Uh, but it's it's extremely complicated depending on what you're working on. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a warning, I guess. Yeah, it would be okay. lo lovely, and I, I have all kinds of ulterior things, is if we could get um, a demo of that by the 28th of January, which is when I'm hosting the OpenShift Commons gathering on data science. Um, and, hey, you should. Yeah, you should reach out to Sherard. I'm sure. I'm sure there are people who would love to do that demo. I, I know. I know for a fact they're like probably eager to get that stuff out there. Yeah, is that Subin model? Uh, no, it probably won't be Subin. Subin's working on the Toth stuff, but you know, it would be like you know someone like Avashek uh, or someone like that who's on the the ODH stuff now. But I would reach out to Sherard Griffin. I think yep. he's still leading that group, so like I'm sure they'd love to get involved. Yeah. No, I think I think you're I think you're right about that. Um. So I, what I had asked quickly is if there's anything glaring that's missing from here, um, John Fortin, uh, Joseph, the, those of you who are out there in end user land really using this, is there anything we're missing? That yeah, we are absolutely interested in the first section. Okay. And and uh, love to help and get them running and test test them. Okay. The bare metal um, is a bare metal operator. There was uh, maybe I mix, I mix it up, but there was a was an installation was a bare metal installation. Something was missing, but it's not an operator. I think it's so, uh, some yeah. Time. The bare metal operator is part of the payload, but we're currently not building it because we don't have um, all the parts to do that with Fedora uh, slash CentOS uh, in this case, mm -hmm. because we're yeah we're doing that for OCP for for the product uh, obviously with. Uh, with RHEL uh, and 
we need, I think, the shim binary there, um, or at least some some parts, some image parts um, for Pixie booting, I think. Um, I think it was no Pixing. It it was only something that has to be done, if I remember so, yeah, correctly. We have, that's work in progress. Uh, we have open PRs for, for this. Um, so bare metal is currently not supported as a platform in OKD, but once it is, it'll just be in the payload. There's no uh, extra operator um, we need for that. Okay. Um, another question: Is it possible, or how how do we take care about the image location? Currently, the images are stored under Open uh, QAIO OpenShift or QAIO, yeah, some OpenShift uh, specific namespaces. Uh, should we open if if we build these operators on our own and manage them? Uh, should we uh, create an OKD working group namespace in Quay or? How do we handle that? I, I have no good feeling in using my own namespace because if I overwrite something during my test, then lots of people will uh, shout at me for for a good reason. Uh, what do you think about that? I would prefer to use OpenShift namespace. That would make things a lot easier. First of all, if this whole thing goes live, we will be using CI meaning we would push images automatically to OpenShift namespace. So there shouldn't be any difference between. But uh, the manual how to do this yourself and use your own uh, custom namespaces is certainly very useful. But in the future, I would prefer to use OpenShift for everything. Why not? Yeah, that's. I think we all would prefer that, um, but the idea was to um, yeah, release the stress from the teams because we we would have to wait for the teams until uh, we get it in OKD in the co community catalog, you know. And if we find a good way to have some intermediate process um, to get it in the catalogs very soon, because it's yeah, in, in the case of the pipeline operator, it's just you call three or four commands and uh, you have it in the in your catalog if you want. Oh yeah, something like staging would probably be useful. Um, I guess SoHDE would be a good start, but uh, we would need some architects and probably folks from Operator Hub opinion. So your proposal so would be good. I, I'd say just uh, publish them to your own namespace for now, open the PR, and once we have that reviewed and everything, we can still uh, copy the images over to, to some uh, other namespace, uh, be it OKD, working group, or whatever, on Quay, uh, before okay. we actually merge merge any PRs. Uh, so I wouldn't block on that now. Uh, we can still create a, a kind of a working group namespace uh, later on. Mm -hmm. Okay. I will do that, and I will uh, change a maintainer to uh, OKD working group, and that should be all. Or is there something I should take care about to not get stressed with legal? The, the icon or the operator name it is called OpenShift Pipeline Operator. Can we can we name it this way in the future, or yeah. do we have? No, no. <laughs> it'll it'll get changed to Tecton Pipelines Operator. It'll 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 turn into something generic or upstreamy. Like Kubevert Operator is not called Kubevert Operator for Red Hat OpenShift Container Platform. It's called something like Red Hat OpenShift uh, virtualization. virtualization or something dumb like that. So mm -hmm. um, Q, so that'll happen with uh, so the Tecton Pipelines Operator will probably just be called. Uh, Kubernetes Tecton. pipelines or Tecton CD or just something yeah. something that's okay. uh, that's useful um, for a community. So I think the Tecton operator actually exists in the upstream. Yeah. That's um, a problem. But, yeah. And that is kind of the one not adapted by by Red Hat. So I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Yeah. It might be just to use get a OKD, brief fix. OKD pipeline. Yeah. Can a use process Tecton question. So. If we, what I would like to use is, is Joseph's efforts um, and get that all, uh, everything figured out in terms of naming and the, what the process is for building that. And I'm wondering if, I know we only meet bi-weekly, bi if we could use this time slot next week 
um, and I'm not sure what Joseph, what your schedule is like, um, to coach and review what Joseph's done and clean it up and get it into um, the OKD cookbook, How to Build and Operators, and, and maybe next Tuesday, um, Joseph, and I'm not sure um, who, who's the best person to help, um, whether it's Christian or Vadim or someone else here, and get one done the way that we as a working group want to do yeah. this. Yeah, it would be um, great. Is Christian or Vadim, are you available next Tuesday? I am not, because um, I'm in a all day meeting next week. Um, but I, I, I'd I'd actually know. prefer to do that asynchronously. Uh, if there's a pull request, it's easy for me to review it uh, whenever it comes on. Mm -hmm. so, so rather than do it, schedule a time to get it done, just do it. And we, could, we could remove all OpenShift references, uh, replace it uh, by um, OKD community, uh, or, or simply only OKD instead of OpenShift. W would that be okay? Or place an OKD before the name of an operator for all OKD operators? And if, um, if I'm understanding what Christian's kind of getting at here, I think like I think what it sounds like, Joseph, is like you should probably just like make make some good decisions on and put it up for review, and then we can just argue about it on the review on on what needs changing and whatnot. You know, like yeah, we can bike shit on the pull request. Right, exactly. Right, exactly. It's like <laughs> yeah. that. That's where the argument about those things should happen. Like okay. I, I think like yeah, just just do what you think is best for now. Put up the PR, and then you know yeah, okay. If, okay. If we have problems with it. Yeah, we'll just figure it out there. Yeah, the okay. super easy thing to do would be just. You know, said find and replace all the words open shift with OKD and be done with it. Yep. And yep. and and we can figure out if that sounds wrong or not on the mailing on the pull request. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right. So we don't need to meet next week, which is fine. I just wanted to <laughs> make that space for us if we if we needed it. So I'm just adding updating this here. So um, because what my goal is, as everybody knows, I always have an ulterior motive is to um, get one done all the way through and then hack our way through the rest of the list. And um, with the Tecton one, it doesn't sound like we need someone from the Tecton community to coach you guys on, on anything anything technical, just um, to get it incorporated in, as a pull request for them to do it in the future. Um, I, I don't think so, because I am using it for building stuff already. Uh, I did not found any any issues I, I can uh, remember of. Um, I, I would I would prefer I would suggest that we, if we have to change something on the operators, um, like I have to change uh, OpenShift to something else, yeah, I will I will fork the repo, mm -hmm. also to the OKD cook uh, cookbook um, organization, and um, we should. Write the uh, changes. This is a, a, a suggestion to this uh, repo I have uh, mentioned before, just to have it uh, written down in a structured way in one repository. How to build OpenShift operators, and it's only an Im immediate uh, intermediate step. If we have the CI's running, we can delete it. But uh, in the meantime, it, I think it's uh, valuable to save uh, this uh, findings somewhere. In one repository, I would I would uh, yeah do it like this, and we should mention this repository, this organization somewhere. I did not find uh, in OKDIO that we have mentioned it. OKD Cookbook. Um, I think it's uh, currently it's inside our know-how. It's yeah it's it's a it's just a landing page at the moment that has links out to um, some of the repos that Charo has done. So we'll need to clean that up a little bit too. Okay. So, um, let's 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 get through next. Hopefully by next Tuesday, that would be my goal. And then when I come out of the three-day all-day meetings, um, I'll take a look at what you guys have done and um, see what we need to do in terms of OKD and the cookbook. The question that's in the back of my mind is: once we have it all done once and we have the Tecton one in our repo working well, I think I heard someone say, and I think it was. Um, Christian, that we need to make a pull request on that operator, um, the, the Tecton operator's repo for them to be informed that this is something we would like them to do on a regular cadence or inform us. 
um, when they have a new release? Yeah, maybe not just a pull request, but we'll, we'll have to introduce some kind of mechanism to make it easy for any team to release um, the current the current operator code they have. Um, meaning that they don't have to do builds manually, they can just take the latest CI builds and kind of mirror them out uh, and tag a release uh, on it and then uh, create automatically, uh, if, if possible, create a PR to the operator hub, uh, the community operators repository um, for that new version, the new CSV um, to be uh, to be merged into the catalog and to show up in, in customer. Okay. I found out that in the most most of the time it's only variable substitution that is needed because exactly. uh, it, um, things are hard coded and it's uh, very easy to replace them with variables. Cool. Well, everyone will get get a little better at building operators then out of this. All right. So um, so that that's really for 2021 in January. What I'd really like to do is just in January and February is push through that list um, and then. Um, if we need to set up a, you know, maybe asynchronous um, pair of programming with people from the community, uh, from who are members of the working group with with anyone from maybe Elasticsearch or whatever, to just um, inform them on what the new process is or the request is. And um, if there are things like variables that need to get changed, um, start working with them and, and identify them. So I now that I have the list, I can kind of, and maybe with Christian and Vadim's help, start looking for who is the point person on each of these things. And I'll reach out to Sherard because I have definitely a, maybe it's a death wish, um, but a wish <laughs> to, to have um, a demo of the um, the Open Data Hub one. I, I do have um, uh, Audrey and uh, Sophie speaking at the January 28th thing, but I don't think I have anyone um, doing I'd love to have like a short video on using the Open Data Hub um, operator on OKD, um, sort of like we did with the uh, the marathon day we did of OKD deployments, is showing them in action on OKD and any tweaks that we had to do. So just to give them a little more publicity in return for their help. So um, the next thing I have on my list here um, is um, Mike, you had brought up on the mailing list the must gather and OKD topic. Um, you want to walk through that and yeah. That. Uh, so before uh, before holiday and everything, uh, Bruce and I and I think a couple others were talking in Slack about you know must gather and kind of like the safety of sharing those things and how useful they are and stuff. And I guess just for a little background for anyone who doesn't know, although I'm guessing most of the people here do know. Uh, must gather is like an administrator tool that we have in OpenShift that'll bundle up a bunch of artifacts from inside the cluster, turn them into a tarball. And then the way we use this in the enterprise uh, product is that, you know, we, we have customers who then share those must gathers with us and we use them to help debug the cluster. Um, this is an extremely useful and I think some would probably say essential tool for us in solving some problems, especially with running clusters. Um, and so, you know, the question that Bruce was raising was like, is it safe to create these and kind of share them publicly? Where should we do it? Because uh, they can they can grow in size up to four or 500 megs. Um, and they're, you know, and this is, the safety issue was kind of the, the heart of it. And I think, you know, Vadim and Christian probably know way more about this than me, but, you know, my my gut feeling is like, it's not safe, but it should be safe. The problem is there are like container logs from your, uh, you know, from your control plane that are included. There are dumps of all sorts of like configuration and objects that exist um, in the control plane that are dumped. So like in a, in a, in the best world situation, it should be safe to do that. But like, it, you know, there are corner cases and I've seen bugs that have come up where, you know, some container logs, especially like sensitive container logs in the control plane are maybe exfiltrating secrets through their logs and whatnot. If they have the wrong verbosity level set, you know, those kind of things. So, you know, to kind of bundle this all up, the reason I sent the email um, and the reason that I kind of looked into this a little more after Bruce and I had talked about it was I think I think for the OKD community, it's going to be like really important for us to figure out a way that we could consume must gathers from the community because it will really help us to solve problems that people are seeing 
you know, it may not be the best tool for every problem that we have, but if we could establish some way to make this, you know, safe and kind of make it like a, a trusted way for people to do this with the OKD community, I think it would be, I think it would be tremendous just to help us out. So anyways, yeah, I wanted to open it up. I think that's a great idea. I think one thing we're going to want to do first is look at examples and make a list of things that are um, possible issues with what is gathered. Because right now, there's Vadim seems to know a fair amount about it, but it seems like there are some edge circumstances. But we need some examples to actually know what those are and under what circumstances that those come about. So I think research would be phase one of this, right? Is find out under what circumstances something, you know, determine something that is uh, sensitive and figure out under what circumstances that it appeared. It, it would be great have... if it, if only OpenShift namespaces were collected. I think it's enough to do so and no secrets, no config maps, and you are fine, I think, in minimum. That's correct. That's what it does. It, we don't, the information from other namespaces is just irrelevant. Um, if I remember correctly, we're stripping passwords from uh, IDP configuration and things like that, but it needs to be verified. I don't have a nice setup where we would, it would be visible. Um, I believe random secrets are also not stored. We're just tracking particular secrets when you're interested in. So it should be safe. The problem is that depends on how much you think sensitive is. Like we still need URL from IDP provider, for instance. You can be considered sensitive, but not exactly. You do, uh, you do grab all the namespaces, so. So like if, if the name um, of if the name of a namespace is sensitive, like there's not much content in it, but all the namespaces are there. Uh, so for instance, I was using it with students where uh, their name goes in the namespace, and then that creates a privacy issue in Canada. Oh, um, so it's safe to rip it out from the actual must gather you're sending us. I was under the impression that we're only getting the open shift, but. Oh, uh, no, because I'm looking at one. We are usually debugging control plane issues, and user namespaces yeah. are right. irrelevant. Well, I guess because it it pulls in all of the uh, operators that are installed um, cluster-wide in every namespace. Yeah, it pulls in the cluster-wide resource. So if there's a, if there's a cluster-wide resource that's exposing that information, and this, you know, what I think what you're bringing up, Bruce, um, is something that probably I, I don't even know if it was thought about. You know, the idea that you might have personal information encoded in your namespace, i.e., like your your name or something, that that might be an opportunity for us to do some work around on the must gather side. You know, maybe things like namespaces and other types of user input names should just be changed to hashes. You know, just across the board, so there's just no PII in there at all. You know, so all all you're doing, because really the main thing for me as a debugger, if I'm looking at one of these must gathers, I might try to match up. You know, like what container was running in what you know area or whatever. So I might see one of those values, and this is exactly you know to the thing that, that Jamie was talking about before. These are exactly the type of bugs we see where you know someone has inadvertently exposed information in what you would think would be a benign resource object, but now it's in the must gather and it's been uploaded forever, right? And and likewise, with the logs coming out of, even even if they're just the logs for containers on the control plane, you know, we just had a bug recently where one of the verbosities was set wrong. So it was dumping everything from that container. And I think, I think Vadim identified it, so I see him shaking, you know, nodding his head. Um, you know, and that was the kind of thing where it was like it was exposing secrets in the logs inside the must gather. So I, I, I kind of got away from what you were talking about. But I think the things that you're talking about maybe give us some ideas on how we could make must gather a little better in terms of scrubbing out some of this information as it does that. Yeah. So you know what you could do? Document be... on... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Bruce. Yeah, yeah no, I was just going to say that... Uh, um one way to keep the information from going across the internet would be to uh, encrypt it uh, with, with uh, you know, like like if you have a uh, a key pair 
uh, then uh, you can encrypt it with a public version, and then it's only visible inside of your organization as opposed to the entire internet, which is not perfect, but it's a lot better. Yeah, especially for the for the OKD community that, I mean, obviously any encryption that we put on it, even if we had keys that were shared with people who were like on the debugger list or whatever that, I, I don't know that that necessarily creates the trust that we, you know, because those, those keys would be pretty weak. You know, someone could share oh, yeah. them or whatever. But but I like I like the notion that, you know, there's a way we could at least store them at rest in a way that's encrypted. Is there an authoritative document on what must gather gathers so that we can look at and actually make well, the scope of what we're I try. I looked or around inside and tried to find something. I did find a document. Unfortunately, I can't share it because it's like, you know, it's Red Hat. <laughs> it has personal. It has Red Hat, you know, co corporate information in it. Um, mm -hmm. The must. I think, you know, what I was thinking as I was reading through this stuff and looking at the must gather repo. I think the next really big step would be to propose like an FAQ or something to that repo. If it's not there already, you know, just a document in that must gather repo that says this is exactly what is collected. Um, because that's where it should live, you know, for everybody, right? I think that's. Yeah, I'm, look, I'm looking at that repo again just to double check. I didn't miss something. But yeah, I mean, it's pretty barren. Um, I guess there is an enhancement they link to. I didn't read that. That that might actually give all the information. I could, I could do a little more research here. But yeah, some I think something there, just a list of like, this is exactly what it does would be cool. So anyways, the, I guess the second kind of the other the second question I had for this group and maybe, you know, I, obviously it's not something we're going to solve now, but something we should think about is kind of like, how would we, you know, how would we have a workflow where an OKD user could create a must gather and then have a place to upload it so that they could link it against, you know, the GitHub issue they opened up or something like that, because I don't think GitHub is going to allow you to push a 500 meg file there. Um, but if we as a community had some way to kind of make this easier for people, it will definitely help us out later when we go to debug these things and whatnot. Yeah, just I don't to, think we can have an official place where folks would upload must gathers. GDPR and that California thing explicitly forbids that. And the Canadians. Yeah, everyone's going to have data protection and data sovereignty things. This is just not a thing you can do. That's a great uh, idea. Yeah. It, it's a, yeah, it's an interesting. I think it's something you've given us something to think about how we could possibly do that. But I also, um, I mean, we have the OKD website. We have. Right. And, well, I, and, and and that's, you know. That's I guess come you know, given my background in kind of dealing with PII and in in machine learning and like how how people are using like you know, encryption to solve those problems. It, it does make me start to wonder about, is there some way that we could we could change the must gather to more aggressively scrub out information, you know, and replace it with just, you know, hashes that can be linked? Like, is there a way to take that must gather tool into the next generation of what data governance really means? Because, like, for those of us fixing the problems, like we don't care about the names and all this, you know, the sensitive information there does not affect me one way or the other. It could all be changed to just hash values that I match up and I can still achieve the same thing. So, you know, like I think there's probably some middle ground we could achieve where those must gathers could become totally just neutral, you know, where it's like it does, it's not going to mean anything to anyone else than the person who created it and the people who are trying to debug from it. Yeah, and just to give you a good example of this, so using it in a university environment, people are going to name their projects um, uh, often with their unique name, their username at the university, you know, and there may be something else in the title of the namespace. There may be other things that, rel that relate to individuals, and in the United States and university settings, that's problematic because people, uh, you're not supposed to even identify what classes that people are taking. Uh, outside of the university and whatnot, so there's, yeah. there's a, a lot of issues about it. M maybe one thing we could do, Mike, is um, 
who is the point person um, in that repo for must gather? Like, they must have thought about this pretty a lot um, when they they were writing it up. So maybe what we could do is have you reach out to them and and, and see what the, what what their what their game game plan was. I probably bring it all behind the Red Hat firewall. Um, yeah. Well, right, right, because we're doing it through Bugzilla and we're bringing these things internal. You know, that's that's a great idea, though, Diane. I, I'll figure out who that is and do some reaching out and just see if I can do a little more, a little more digging just to see what they were thinking and what. And, and maybe they've got some ideas around this that they're already kind of working on. Yeah, who knows? A new tech for encrypting all of it and storing it somewhere safely. Blah blah blah. You know, or it's an area for innovation. Um, so I right. wanted to. I, yeah. I just want one more chance to bring out the term homomorphic encryption. That's that's just my main goal here. Is to, you know. All right, all right, all right. Use the big words. Yes, thank you. Um, <laughs> it's all good. Right. So Th thank you. That that makes me feel a lot better. Now I don't have to use it again until 2022. So. All right. Oh, come on. <laughs> Brain bone. Um, all right. So I, I just wanted. Um, I know there's been a lot of chat while you were talking about must gather uh, because as soon as anyone says the word arm. Or Raspberry Pi in any tech meeting, everything blows up in chat. Um, so I wanted to ask Jeremy um, Linton to introduce himself because he's new to the meeting um, and he's from the ARM world, and maybe um, talk a little bit about what's been going on in the chat there around um, needing needing some place to test ARM and that. So Jeremy, can I get you to turn your microphone on if it's not? Too, um... Yes, I just did. <laughs> I guess a uh, quick intro. I, I guess I'm Jeremy Linton. I'm actually one of the Red Hat partner engineers. Uh, I've been all kernel years now. We don't see you. Yeah, I guess you can have a camera too, but I've. Uh, there we go. There we go. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, I've, uh, I guess I went to a flock a couple years ago. I'm sort of somewhat active on the side as well. Uh, Upstream kernel, Kiana core, that kind of stuff. And I guess the chat I was talking about, the Pi firmware task force, which I can get hub page, uh, which is there's a UEFI firmware for the Raspberry Pi that allows it to boot a wide range of operating systems, Windows, you know, CentOS to a certain extent. <clears throat> there aren't drivers for some of the hardware yet in CentOS because it's not a supported rel target. Uh, but yeah, it works. Fairly well in in Fedora. It's getting better every day. Uh, like right now, I have some PCI patches posted that are hopefully going to merge. That'll give us native PCI support instead of having to use the USB XHCI as a platform device. There's a long list of things. Anyway, so I guess personally, uh, with the up and coming OpenShift release for Red Hat, I'm sort of getting in front of a bit of that uh, and seeing if I can do a little bit of contribution or testing with OKD on maybe that platform, Graviton, whatever seems to be desirable at the moment. I have a pretty wide range of SBSA platforms I can test it on. And a couple of years ago, I actually spun up OpenShift like for, I guess, OKD from source and sort of got it working, but haven't really touched it since. Well, I think if, and this is, I was just talking yesterday with the folks um, who do developer.com, Red Hat developer.com, and they've been asking me for very specific things, developer-focused topics. Um, so you're 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 my lead into this conversation about, and I and I know um, ARM and Raspberry Pi are really hot topics for um, folks. So if even if you just wrote up a blog, they would, and I would funnel it into them about your adventures in deploying OKD on ARM. That would be a great spot to start. Um, the other thing, and Charo's not here, I'm going to try and get Charo to do one on um, using the code ready container. I think we have videos of it, but we don't have any write up how to's or anything like that for developer.com, specifically with OKD. There was a, a question, Joseph, you put in about the tool chain for uh, code ready containers. Um, so I'll see if I'm, I can track down um, Charo to do that. And then um, Craig Robinson, who I don't think is on the call today, did a nice um, using his um, deploying OKD uh, for, I think it was 4.4 on his home lab. So the more content we can get that is um, specifically like things that developers are just going to eat up like candy, 
which is what I think of raspberry pies as candy. I love them. Um, so and there's too many of them in my house um, right now. And um, but I, I think that would be that would be great if you have a, the platforms to test on. Um, you know, we definitely would help you out doing that. And and a recipe. What we're trying to do is create sort of a cookbook of recipes on how to do that. And I'm trying to drive adoption of OKD um, because for me, and this is just my philosophy of OKD, uh, allows us to do a great lot of collaboration with the Fedora CoreOS community. Um, and, and like we saw with 4.6, when things happen in Fedora CoreOS that impact us, we're basically the early warning system for um, for a lot of things, um, Fedora CoreOS, which will eventually end up in Rail CoreOS, which will, you know, so it's really great for us to be able to do that testing on ARM and any other places as well. So thumbs up, thanks for joining us. That would be, that's great. Um, and if anybody wants to help him with that, I can see chatter going on. So oh. yeah, a short, a short recap of what we talked about in the chat. So from OKD's perspective, we don't run on ARM yet because we don't build ARM64 images. That can be fixed, relatively simple, but um, the problem is cadence. We probably would be able to build just uh, released images because that would take time and precious resources, and OKD can afford that. Um, another problem is um, we are targeting 16 gigabytes masters, and I don't think Raspberry Pis can allow that. But that is being nope. addressed on OpenShift scale because um, they are targeting three masters on eight gigabytes. So we will get that for free once we release on uh, once we this lands in 4.7, for instance. Okay. Um, and another problem was. Yeah, I'm not sure how good Fedora CoreOS itself supports Raspberry Pis, for instance, and so on, but we probably... The answer to that is not very. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think there's a lot of work left. There, there are already uh, ARM builds from the community, from the Typhoon, I think it is, um, yeah. uh, this uh, Kubernetes distribution that also runs on Fedora CoreOS. And we're actively working on, on actually building official ARM images as well. Right, so, and um, Fedora CoreOS already does produce ARM64 images, AR64 images, whatever you want to call them now. Um, and the main issue right now is that the Raspberry Pi 4 series, like between the, the eight gigabyte model, which is the only reasonable model to actually use for, for OKD, uh, has a sufficiently different Hardware base and DT and device tree and components and drivers and stuff that none of it has been upstreamed into the Linux kernel. So Fedora has basically no functional support for the eight gigabyte model. The four gigabyte model mostly works. The eight gigabyte model does not work. Uh, and Listen. the Raspberry Pi Foundation doesn't care about upstreaming stuff. So that turns into a whole nother set of messes about getting the Raspberry Pi 4 to work correctly and the four series in general. Right, and this is why the, I was pointing out the Pi firmware task force because it's turning it into an ACPI platform. There's no device tree. I mean, you can run a device tree with that thing, but it's uh, it's intended to be an ACPI platform. Yeah, uh, but that doesn't fix the issue of like legitimately the hardware that's on there is different, and we have no drivers for it. Like, for example, the CPU, the SOC is actually different, which means it has a different memory controller. It has a different GPU chip on board. It has different memory partitioning, all those sorts of things. And while some of it is, it seems to be kind of okay with the Raspberry Pi 4 UE5 firmware. Um, like for example, uh, we, there is no way for anything but Raspberry Pi OS to use the full eight gigs of RAM. With the UE5 firmware, it's relatively straightforward to get everything to use the full eight gigs of RAM um, on 64 bit. Uh, yes, it only works on 32-bit. Don't ask me. I have no idea why that 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 restriction exists that way. It makes no sense. Um, so, folks, well, I just want I just want to recognize that it is the top of the hour, and this is oh. when we do end um, normally. Um, and I'm sure everybody's got a, a stacked email or whatever to do that. So, um, 
I'm, I'm happy to let it, Jeremy, if you want to drive a conversation about this, um, we can also do like we did with the vSphere triage um, last month, um, use a Tuesday, not next Tuesday, because I have a meeting, but any of the non week things here to just have a, a session on um, testing and once you've done a little experimenting, come back and, and host a, a triage session because it's obviously something people are interested in seeing if we can get working. Um, so that would be, um, would make me happy. Um, and um, I know Amy Merrick is on the call and she's being quiet. Um, so happy 2021. And I was going to ask her to um, uh, give me a hand reviewing the documentation and the um, contribution, you know, contributor ladder stuff that's on um, our, in the OKD site so that we're a little bit better um, adhering to best practices and stuff like that. I think we can use that. And I know, Amy, that's something you've done very nicely for a number of other communities. So um, I'll try and hit you up um, in Slack or somewhere. Um, Just hit me up. And we'll we'll get that just just to take a, maybe do an audit because um, from my perspective we've stuck that stuff on OKD.io we've got a website that's separate from the GitHub um, we've got the GitHub documentation we've got the, that so just really kind of one of my goals for 2021 is to get our um, our documentation up to snuff um, our cookbook um, working effectively and um, it may mean uh, quite a big thing and I was hoping I could get Amy and and Josh. Um, Berkus, who's also from the OSPO group, um, to take a look at that um, as a, an initiative for 2021. Um, so that's that's what I had for today. So I didn't mean to cut you off there, um, Neil, but yeah, I have to. Fine. And, um, and, and people will start dropping off. And um, I will 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 keep this on the menu um, for the two weeks from now, Jeremy. If you want to come back um, with whatever thoughts you have, and then if we need to set up a the alternate week um, to do stuff on the Raspberry Pi ARM stuff. I'm sure there will be people who will join you in this endeavor, um, including myself. So um, that would be great. And if there's anyone else on the call whose agenda, and we had um, folks say from the, um, the GitHub Actions team that they were going to come, and from one other group, um, from the Power folks, we're going to talk about something, and but I don't see any of them. I didn't see any of them in the and hey, the people, I'm the here. People. Oh, Michael Turk. Michael Turk, yeah. from IBM. Yeah. Yeah. So hey. I, hey, Mike. <laughs> so, so next, I, I know you keep coming, and I didn't and didn't see you um, on in the chat. Oh, it's fine. I'm sorry. So we'll um, next time we'll also give you some airtime if you want to talk about the PPC 64LE stuff because that might help spur that as well. So. Um, yeah, and I mean we can frame it also as a. Alt arch in general, yeah. kind of thing. Um, so maybe uh, some of this arm stuff can also be helpful there as well. Yeah. So I think that that would be great. Um, and maybe that maybe that's just an alt arc working sub working group set of conversations too. Because um, for me, 2021 is OKD everywhere. So um, let's see if we can make that happen and get the, the OKD um, operators going um, and just drive adoption. Um, I wanted to give a shout out quickly to Jamie. Thank you for the FAQ updates. Um, and a reminder for folks that we do, and then I'll send a, date, a timeline and session. We have a, um, a slot at DevComp in February to do uh, birds of a feather. Um, so I will send that time out and then we'll figure out how to um, run that that group meeting too once I have that time but that's um, what I have for today and I just wanted to wish everybody a happy and healthy 2021 and thank you for your participation it really makes this whole thing wonderful um, and I'm just really thrilled to have all of you here so thanks and um, have a great week and we'll see you in two weeks time see y'all thank you Diane yeah, thanks to you too, Diane. Yeah, Bye. thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.